There we go. All right, today is world building tips and tricks, um, also known as world building do's and don'ts, but I feel like that sounds a little harsh, so I went with tips and tricks. Because sometimes it, it's frustrating to be told what you can and cannot do when it comes to writing. And it's less about what you can and cannot do and more about what things are going to help your world building and what things are going to harm your world building and make it feel rushed or uh, spliced together is another good term for it. All right, so first, do you want to talk about the do's first or the don'ts first? I'm curious. Let's do the don'ts first. Okay. All right. I need to get those down and I know not. Don't. All right. Here's the don'ts of world building. With your prologue, first chapter, etc., the or even short story. This can actually happen in short stories. I read even in college the other day a story that did this where it was just so much. AK the info dump. Now, what is an info dump? Let's define it real quick just for those who may not know on the video or those of you who do not know here, even though I think you guys do. Um, an info dump is when you give like four times the information needed for one scene. Or sometimes you just start rambling as if you are a historian. You're like, oh, by the way, did you know this cool fact? This warlord decided to, and you're like, does this have any relevance? And if it does, can you tell me later? It's basically where if you go to a restaurant, generally you expect a good size portion, right? Unless you purposely ordered something small, right? You expect what you order. It would be like saying, I ordered the kid's meal and then getting a buffet. You're, you're kind of going, slow down, there's no way my four-year-old's gonna eat that. <laughs> I want the kids to That is insane. Why can't I get a french fry this long? <laughs> yeah, five feet long french fry and a six foot tall chicken nugget. Yeah, like, I love yeah. that pardon? <laughs> I like to ask myself, is this like history of Hogwarts? Is this Hermione speaking? Ah, uh, yes. Or is this some random fact mentioned that keeps things spicy? Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. And especially, it, you have to take into account how you do it. Info dumping can be done well, but the problem is you, you have to do several different things. One, you have to chunk it up. So you take little bits throughout. For example, Harry Potter knows nothing about magic. That's part of the reason that J.K. Rowling was able to say, hey, can you just give a little tip, a little trick here and there via Ron and Hermione, who know this world better than he? Yes? There's a common trope in like, movies and stuff mm -hmm. where they throw an apprentice who knows nothing about exactly kind of like uh, the doctor with Sherlock mm -hmm. precisely it makes it so that when they give their explanation it feels natural because it's like oh they're an apprentice or they're a newbie or for whatever reason they've never learned this it makes it so as you're info dumping it feels natural because that is how you would be if you were an apprentice in this universe you'd naturally feel that um, you also, another thing you can do with info dump is dialogue. Now, the thing you have to be aware of here is what's called Maiden Butler dialogue. So there's a fine line between the two. Um, there's info dumping in a good way where you have two characters who are like, did you hear about the queen the other day? No, no, I didn't tell me. You know, and you're like, oh, what's about this queen? Is she sick? Is she ill? Is she crazy? You know, you're curious. Or there's the maiden butler dialogue where you say, as you know, the queen is ill. And despite the fact that you know that, I'm going to tell you more about it. And it's like, okay, unless you're purposely writing a snob, <laughs> that's generally not how you talk to people, right? You don't go up to someone and say, just so you know, I know you already know this answer, but I'm going to tell you two plus two is four. And it's like, that, no, no one talks like that unless they're a complete jerk. <laughs> so either make them a jerk or don't have them talk like that. <laughs> but they call it Maiden Butler dialogue because they did it a lot in old movies with the maid and the butler where they'd be like, the master comes home at six and his corgi needs to be washed. <laughs> it's like, okay. Why do we need to know that? <laughs> Especially if you already know that and you're just reminding the butler who already washed the corgi that he needs to wash the corgi. Okay? <laughs> it just felt awkward. It felt silted, but they felt that was necessary. 
Writing has evolved over time. That is something I will constantly reiterate. Um, another thing you need to be aware of with info dumping is an, a thing you can do well is if you haven't come out of a history book. Brandon Sanderson does a little bit of this with some of his stuff where he'll quote things from what seem to be old history or journals or things like that. That way he's giving you information yeah, at the start of the chapter to give you an intrigue, but he doesn't do that all at the beginning, right? If he gave you all that journal entry right at the beginning as a prologue, whew, that, that could be a little rough to read. But because he gives you it in chunks at the beginning of each chapter, you're slowly pulled along by this trail of breadcrumbs. Um, Beyond that, if you're going to do a historical reference or a journal, make sure you write it like a historical reference or a journal. You don't want to tell the readers things. You still want to show the readers things. You tell them in a showy way. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, tactful telling, exactly. And technically Jade coined that term, or maybe someone else did, but Jade, Jade claims it, so. <laughs> but with tactful telling, it is, crucial that you make sure you tell them in a way that is showing. Like, for example, if it's a historian, if you have a super nerdy character who's like, oh my gosh, I want to learn all about history, and the historian's like, well, I can tell you, it, that works a lot more naturally than if you're just like in the beginning. And in 1694, the warlord decided to go against the, the blah, 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 and the blah, blah, blah won the blah, 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 and this is why it matters. Oh, and by the way, this bloody stone in the hearth of this fiery magic dragon is the key to it all but you have to slay the dragon first and it's like okay can we figure that out later you're telling me too much too much i'm getting six foot chicken nuggets and four foot fries when i ask for a kid's meal <laughs> you need to you need, make sure you chunk it up keep it small <laughs> all right now the next don't is changing the rules of your magic system Ooh. Now, this often happens because it's more convenient for you as a writer, right? You're like, I made this rule that you can never use magic if you have blue hair. But then you're like, shoot, the main character has blue hair and I really wanted them to have magic. Well, they're just the exception. No! no. Please, no! <laughs> no, you have gotta explain why it did or didn't work, why they have blue hair and the magic works, um, if it, doesn't work or if they learned the magic you gotta explain why that's possible if you're gonna have it rule exceptions you've got to explain it within the rules does that make sense yeah. it's kind of like chess you can do lots of crazy wild moves that I don't even know anything about within the rules I don't know. is this writers club yes okay yeah. <laughs> so as long as you are following the rules that you priorly made, you can make exceptions to your own rules, find your own loopholes. However, you need to make sure they're genuine loopholes. You can't just have a black and white rule that you then immediately break for your own convenience. There needs to be a purpose to it, a reason, or even just a foreshadowing of why it might have been broken. Say, hey, your, your character with blue hair has magic, but they're not supposed to be able to. Anyone with blue hair can't have magic. In, and then say, oh, that's so bizarre, that's so weird. I wonder if maybe it's this curse. Okay, well now it's more interesting, you know? Maybe they're cursed, maybe there's something weird about it. It get, helps give you a little bit more to explain the world in a way that makes sense without upsetting your reader and feeling a little bit like deus ex machina. Now, I actually have a 15 minute lesson for Adult Writers Club on Deus Ex Machina on the YouTube page for the Liar Writers Club if you guys want to um, watch those. Those are generally, I would, the reason I'm doing them for Adult Writers Club is because it's more about focused on editing, publishing, and advanced writing techniques, but you guys can absolutely watch them if you wish. So, and they're super short. Generally, I do 15 minutes long. <laughs> All right, so with the next don't, um, tell us details that aren't really necessary to moving your plot forward. So I call this world immersion gone wrong. Although Brandon King Sanderson does this. See, that's the thing. Brandon Sanderson does and he doesn't. I will, I will get Brandon. Brandon's the interesting one. Gosh darn it, Brandon. Anyway. <laughs> Brandon Sanderson is but. the exception. Like, if he is an exception, 
to <laughs> all the rules. That's all, all of he's them. Brandon. <laughs> he's he's Brandon. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> with with Brandon Sanderson, um, with his world immersion. Oh my gosh, I didn't put space there. All right. Yeah. All right. With world immersion gone wrong, generally it's something that doesn't move the plot forward. So with Brandon Sanderson, a lot of his stuff actually does move the plot forward in subtle ways, though. It's, it's so subtle that you don't even notice it, and then later you're like, oh my gosh, that character actually mattered. Wait, that outfit, it's the same outfit. She's gonna die now, or whatever. <laughs> it, like, it all comes together at some point. Um, but it's a lot subtler, and you can get away with that. You would just need to do a whole heck of a lot of work. I recommend, when doing world immersion, use five senses and hit each of the five senses and try not to go too crazy. So, for example, if you're in a market, does the market smell like cinnamon rolls? Because the lady next door is selling cinnamon rolls. Great. Duh, um, are you feeling the textiles as you stare at these gorgeous dresses or something? Um, are you seeing this shifty man in the corner who may or may not be a thief and you have to watch out? Um, are you, oh gosh, help me with the other senses. <laughs> he, uh, hearing, right? Oh uh, yeah. Hearing, what is the other one I haven't covered? I feel like I'm missing one. Taste? Taste, there you go. <laughs> so you can hear the busy marketplace and everyone crowding around or the laughter of children if it's a particular popular place with kids. Yeah. Or, or if, if you you're super important like a uh, yes. conversation that pops out at you. Right, a conversation this, like, pops out at you. See that you're it, you know. Yeah, exactly. Cool things like that can you can absolutely do. You can also intimate what kind of market it is, right? Because if there are children laughing, it's probably a very safe, family-friendly market with some like, sparkling down. Whereas no. if it's uh, a whole bunch of adults wearing cloaks and shifting around, you're like, oh no, <laughs> this is the black market. I, I may or may not get kidnapped yeah. and sold. <laughs> like, no, it, it gives it, a different context. It Yes, yes, but at the same time, you want to you wanna make sure that you immerse your readers, but you don't immerse them so much you're drowning them. Once again, this is about portion sizes. <laughs> you're, you're ordering a kid's meal, you don't want the six foot fry and six foot chicken nugget. It's just, no. <laughs> you want the, yeah, you want the tiny fries and like six chicken nuggets. <laughs> so it's like, it's nice, you know, it's compact, it's tiny. Like it gives you enough to keep you satisfied. Whereas with the other, you're just completely and utterly drowning them in detail. You're like, do you enjoy this? And their head is in the water and they're going, no. <laughs> so, but with Brandon Sanderson, where he does it right is he, he immerses you in an ocean of detail, but he's not drowning you. He always makes sure you have just enough to keep your head above water. And that's tricky. That's tricky to do. <laughs> I would recommend starting with the other, and then if you want to go with the just barely head above water Brandon Sanderson method, go ahead and try it. Just be wary. Your editor may or may not want to delete certain things, and you have to fight for their validity. Brandon Sanderson actually has to do this too. He often has, um, according to him and his editor, I listened to one of their podcasts at one point, his editor mentions that they cut usually about two thirds of his novel. It's a, it's a massive thing originally. <laughs> that is the most patient editor on the planet. But Do anyway, you know, his on that, though? <laughs> just the biggest yeah. book ever. Or, anyway, or the like this thing. <laughs> exactly. What? It's the biggest book. But anyway, um, the point is that he has to fight for. Hey, this matters. Or the editor has to say, sorry, does this really matter? Does it really matter what color her eyeshadow is? No, no it doesn't. It does. <laughs> but then if it does, but then if it does, he can say, but it does, and then he can prove it. Like, because if you wear that exact same eyeshadow, then this one, like, bounty hunter or something, there you go. See? will hunt you down. Kill this specific shoot. thing. Yes, see, you gotta, you gotta make sure that you know that, so that way when your editor mentions, hey, please fix this, then you can say, actually, there's a reason. <laughs> there's, so there's a purpose to my madness. With the bounty hunter, like, for yes. you sleep, usually bounty hunters want you a lot so they can get paid for bringing you a lot of It depends on the type the of bounty hunter, I suppose. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. it's dead or alive. <laughs> it depends on the bounty. 
It is but fair. still. If it's like a woman which is like dead or like you can kill them in the <laughs> All right. We can get more on that later. The next point that I'm going to mention with don'ts in world building is skipping straight to the action. So this is when you underworld build. Trying to remember how to spell things, because I forget once I start writing. Okay, there we are. So this is where you skip straight to the action. You just plunge into it. This is also known as white room syndrome, but not a lot of people know about that. So as a result, I'm going to explain it like this, but it's technically formally known as white room syndrome. This is where you do not describe where you are. Hence why it's called white room syndrome. Um, or in my case, skipping straight to the action. You're just like, it doesn't matter where we are. All that matters is that he is dying. And it's like, okay, that does matter, but what context is this? Is this in his house and he's 80 years old? Is this on a battlefield and there's a freaking sword in his chest? You know, that gives a drastically different feel. One is, oh, wholesome, my family's near me as I'm dying and I'm, you know, like, everyone's or, by me. At, or, <laughs> or just like, Oh yeah, no one's here and I'm dying. No yes. one knows. Or or is it or are they alone? Are they completely alone and they're like, you know, I was an assassin in life and I'm dying at, you know, eighty seven and no one loves me because of the fact that I killed so many people. You know, th there's that. Or there's also the whole, like I said, the battlefield. Are they being clutched in their friends' arms? Are is it smelling like blood? Why are they fighting this battle? I will say the only thing you have to be careful with, with the skipping straight to the action as well, is that you want to make sure you have the action. Absolutely. You don't want to input on, but you don't want to skip so, so much into the action that you completely miss, like I said, the context. Rooms give context. Even what we're standing in right now, this is more of a classroom-like setting, right? So it gives more, it makes more sense that I'm talking up here teaching, whereas if I was in a concert hall with a bunch of guitar players around me, having me talk like this and point at a whiteboard makes no sense. <laughs> There's context necessary. And especially because you don't want them imagine, this is important, we were actually just talking about this before you guys came in, we started the lesson. Um, with describing things, you wanna make sure you describe the character early and the setting early. Why? Because otherwise, if you describe it late, you can cause confusion with yeah, your poor so reader. Wait, <laughs> I thought that you were in a Why are you dying in a library? Exactly. Why are you in a library? I thought you were on the battlefield. There's a sword through your chest. I assumed you were in battle. You're in a library with a sword through your chest? That's very different. <laughs> I wanted to see the swords were clinging together. Exactly. you got to make sense of this. It has to give context. And then you also have to give context when it comes to characters. That characters are a part of world building, yes. And you gotta make sure you do that early. Not so early that you're immediately like in the first line, by the way, I have black hair. But you also gotta make sure it's within the first paragraph or the first page. If you go much beyond the first page, and especially with first person, it can be hard. Because with first person, you don't know the gender generally, unless, unless you say, I swept my dress around my ankles. That generally indicates a female, but who knows? It could be a cross-dressing male. You don't know that. Um, <laughs> until later in the book. Until later in the if book. They explain it. Oh my. <laughs> if they explain it. Exactly. So it's important with character that you describe things early. So that way, anything that's important doesn't throw them out of the story later. For instance, if it's like crucial that they have, for instance, let's go with the blue hair example, blue hair, and that's crucial to your story. And then halfway through your story, you're like, they have blue hair, and you never mentioned it before then. They're like, I imagine them with black hair. Hi. Story ruined, now I have to go rethink my life. <laughs> the story isn't completely ruined, but it does, it breaks the enchantment of the story, the spell. They have blue hair, then why do they just do a magic spell? Huh? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> then why did they just do a magic spell? Why did you just break your rule? I now want to write a short story about blue-haired people who do magic. Well, don't, don't do magic. It's just rather... <laughs> anyway. Um, all right. So, skipping straight to the action isn't good. However, as we mentioned before, with the world immersion gone wrong, 
you can also go too long with the world building. So too So with the two going on too long with world building, this is when you're trying to cram way too much in way too little time. Once again, it's just about portioning. So for instance, if you have a short story, maybe you don't need to describe the religious points in a six page short story. Unless it's like crucial to your story, maybe don't talk about this guy believes in this religion. Yeah, no, you explain it, if it's not important, probably like, leave it out. You explain every <laughs> single character that you see, bump into, or at all, like, yep. notice. And you make sure that every single little detail is, that can be good, but the problem is with short stories and the beginning of novels, you don't want to throw, like I said, you don't want to just toss them in. You want to you have them ease, they want to dip their toe into the water and then be like, oh, okay, this is a cool fantasy world, now I'm swimming. Instead of just being like, yeet them into the ocean, have fun. <laughs> it's like, hope you can swim. <laughs> hope you can swim. Yeah, they may not even know how to swim. They're like, this is unfamiliar territory. I just got bit by a shark, bye. And they, and they die. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> you have to be careful. <laughs> like, oh, so that's why I'm being sued. <laughs> so you gotta make sure when you throw when you throw your readers in that they know what they're doing. That you've kind of eased them into it. That you've described the characters in a not overwhelming way. That you've given what details necessary, and you show don't tell. Part of the problem that comes with all of these is telling rather than showing. If you show rather than tell, you will have far less of these problems. There are still some of these problems that occur even if you show don't tell. However, there's far less of these if you show don't tell. It's less likely to occur. It's kind of like prevention is not the cure, you know, taking of a lot of vitamin C and making sure you wash your hands is all fine and dandy. And wearing masks, I support it 110%. Um, <laughs> It, it's all prevention though, right? It's all prevention, but it doesn't guarantee that once you get a cold or COVID or a flu, that you're immediately gonna be cured. You know, it's all prevention. So showing and not telling is all prevention. These are more talking about things to avoid as well. So it adds a little bit more to your prevention than just showing. All right, now we're gonna talk about the fun stuff. What you should do. <laughs> I probably could have just erased the and and kept the do, but that's fine. I'll just put it back. All right. All right, world building, do. All right, so things you should do. You gotta make sure that your world has checks and balances. You gotta make sure that everything, yeah, we're just gonna say balance for now. Gotta make sure that everything makes sense. For instance, if you have people who can, if you have people who glow in the dark, right? For instance, they're all magical, they all glow in the dark, or they're a race of aliens that all glow in the dark, they won't need to invent candles. No. Never. They'll never need candles. No lights. Nor lights or electricity or any of these kinds of things. Like, I guess they might need electricity, but Will they? Electricity was mainly centered around light bulbs, right? So you gotta think of the consequences of the things you build. If you have people who glow in the dark, then you aren't gonna have cool candles on the castle walls. So maybe don't say, hey, there are these epic torches on the castle walls. And it's like, well, the people glow in the dark. Why are there torches? Yeah, um, you know, it's <laughs> like, like crucial, because like, if, like, since they glow in the dark, but if, yeah. they, but if they like stay dark like more than 20 minutes, they like start disintegrating. Yeah, or something like that. You gotta make sure that there's some sort of reason that they have what yeah, they have or they don't have what they don't have. The dark and he's like, oh, no one can know, you know. Yeah, exactly. There's gotta be there's gotta be a reason for things. You gotta make sure that it's balanced out and think about those consequences because that does happen. I mean, even in real, even in real life, you know, if a particular crop like apples, for instance, gets spoiled or like recently with the birds getting all sick and everything, right? That means that prices of chicken and turkey and things like that have gone up, right? 
or things like apples, they can only make so many, so there's a scarcity value of apple juice or something like that. If they all got eaten by worms or something, a particular crop died. You know, that means less apple juice. So maybe you can buy apple juice, but your best friend got to the store too late, there's no more apple juice. So you just gotta make sure if you have X, that X causes Y, and that your Y makes sense as well. You can't have it make no sense. <laughs> you can't say, oh, well, they all glow in the dark, so of course they need torches. What? <laughs> it's gotta logically follow. Logic paths are very important, and something that a lot of science fiction and fantasy writers tend to neglect because it's just like, well, it's fantasy. Yes, but it feels more realistic if it follows some basic logic. They all glow in the dark, but they think the glowing is caused by an angry devil. So they, so they refuse to glow. They try to hide it. See, there you go. That's a fantastic reason. They're all like, it's of the devil, and so if you even glow once, you're possessed. <laughs> that makes it so much and more interesting. It makes and it more reliable. Point where the main character turns the lights off and then the <laughs> starts executing. Ooh, okay. that would be rough. Wait, I love this plan. All right. <laughs> so, oh man, that would be wild. And then everyone turns the lights and so they start glowing. And then everyone goes for like super scared. They walk around their house. That'd be very interesting. All right. So, two. You gotta make sure that you explain how their way of life works in a way that makes sense. If it's different than ours. If it's just like, oh, well, it's kind of like Harry Potter or, um, I can't think, or, my brain is slow, Percy Jackson, there we go, where they're living in our world, but there are exceptions because they're demigods or wizards or witches, then you gotta create your own world, yes, but you gotta make sure it still fits within our world. And that makes it a lot easier. You don't have to worry about this as much. But if you're doing like Brandon Sanderson, where you're like, this is an entirely different world with an entirely different culture, you gotta explain how that culture affects their way of life. For instance, uh, you gotta talk about the good and the bad. Um, so let's say, affects way of life. So, with it affecting their way of life and culture. For instance, I thought I thought this was a fabulous example the other day on Instagram. Um, I, so this is not me, this is a fabulous post on Instagram. Um, they were talking about if you have certain cultures that do certain things, it's gonna have X, Y, and Z effect, kind of like we just talked about, this talk about how it affects their life. For example, if they all worship pigeons and think they are sacred beings. And then a pigeon dies. Uh, then a pigeon dies, that's fair, there's that, and everyone starts weeping and sobbing, and the characters and the readers like, oh my gosh, is this character okay? And it's like, no, it's just their way of life. They think they're sacred beings. Or, then you even gotta talk about the gritty stuff. Think about the consequences, once again. Having that many pigeons, there's gonna be a lot of bird poop everywhere. <laughs> I, I thought that was fascinating because I was like, you know, you're right. You just love to see this, you know, beautiful culture with birds and people getting all along, but there there would be bird poop everywhere, man. <laughs> it would be the worst. See, there you go. And then like say, oh, well, all them um, sacred birds have to live in this temple where there's these lush gardens because it's fertilizer. See, there you go. You change the culture so it makes sense in your world. And you make sure that the side effects have a purpose. They, they move smoothly together. And you gotta make sure that you keep track of all this. I think it's the biggest problem. Which leads me to my next point, actually. Keep a compendium. Or a spell book, or whatever you wanna call it. You can come up with a fancy name for it. Um, <laughs> but basically, Make sure you write your own compendium as you're going. I've actually been doing that recently for something I've been writing, where I even write down character descriptions in there, just so that way I don't accidentally say later, they have straight hair, and JK in the first page, I said curly. You know, you gotta make sure those things flow, and generally editors will catch that sort of thing, but they don't always. So it's important that you do your best to keep that in check in the first place, yes? But what if, oh. what if 
his hair turns from curly to straight throughout the progression of the story. Hmm. In that case, you're going to have to explain that and make sure that you have it fluid throughout, I would say. curly hair straight to Yes, if it's, a, if it's a mood thing, when he gets <laughs> mad, <laughs> or something like that. Or if it like, like, happens over a time, you can have, like, it's starting out with a bounce, like, you know, or right? like, bounce back Boing. up, and then, like, a few days later, it loses the bounce. Yeah. And then, a few days later, there are waves and not curls. And then... You just gotta make sure you emphasize it, so it doesn't seem like it came out of nowhere. Or if it does yeah. come out of nowhere, you gotta have someone mention it, like... Dude, what happened to your hair? <laughs> it, it could be like a side arc in that, and like the hair is a metaphor, because like- The hair is a metaphor, like, this is fair. Like when the hair is like all curly and his life is like totally out of order and whack, and like, and then as it, as the story progresses- He's pulling his life and together. He, and he gets his stuff together, <laughs> the hair straightens out. There you go. But see, you'd want to mention that too in your compendium. Um, you want to make sure that cultural things are mentioned here, magic rules are mentioned here, character looks are mentioned here, um, various world building things are mentioned here. Um, for example, if at the beginning of the story you mention, hey, so and so's wife, I don't know, became a zombie or something, then you got to make sure you remember that and don't say, oh yeah, they're one big happy family later, and they're like, wait, but wasn't the wife a zombie? <laughs> got to make sure that you have consistency. So the compendium, <laughs> yeah, so the, the compendium's more just to make sure that you have consistency in, throughout your novel. And honestly, again, your editor is supposed to help with this. However, if you're um, traditionally publishing, they will accept you a lot easier if you um, have things like a compendium to help keep everything straight because plot holes, magic holes, and character flaws that are, and by character flaws I mean like out of character, you know, where they're the sweetest, kindest person to everyone and then they kill a cat, and you're like, what? You said person though. <laughs> but, that, but see, that doesn't make any sense though, where they're super, ni they're super nice to like every creature, I don't know, they have a pet hamster that they absolutely love and adore and then one day they strangle their pet hamster. That just doesn't make sense. Um, I mean, you could make it make sense, but you got to make sure it makes sense. And this is where the compendium comes into play. <laughs> yes, the secret that you learn the hamster is possessed. Like, that would make sense. But if there's no reason for it, you know, you got to make sure it has a reason. Those are the big three, though, that I would say make publishers reject you. And I will go in further detail on that in an adult writer's club lesson. Just because, again, I'm talking more about publication editing and uh, more advanced concepts with that. But... Yeah, that, those are the biggest three problems that people get rejected for, which is so sad, because honestly, there I've seen some great stories in my time when I was an editing intern, and they were absolutely fabulous, and I wanted to accept them. I voted for them and when we came to the team meeting, and I was like, yes, this is the one. And they were all like, but, but magic flaws. And I'm like, but they can fix it. And they're like, but this person has no magic flaws. And I'm like, but they can fix it. And they're like, no. It's, it's more work. And unfortunately, publishing companies would rather take on an author that they feel has their, has their crap together rather than taking an, on an author that is kind of a mess, even if their story is a fantastic idea, or their writing style is fantastic, or their author voice is fantastic. So this is why compendiums are your lifesaver, because the more in order your story is in the beginning, the more likely you are to get that editor who's gonna help flush those things out and fix those things. All right, moving on to the next one. If you're doing realistic fiction, so I'm gonna mention realistic fiction. You gotta make sure that you know almost everything. I'm gonna say almost because it depends on what you're doing. For instance, if you're in New York, New York's a huge city. You don't need to know the name of every freaking person in New York at the time of the story of your book. Don't need it. <laughs> However, if it is realistic fiction in a tiny town with a population of 25, you might want to know everyone's name. Because likely, they all grew up knowing each other's names. But then, but <laughs> then 23 of them died. Oh gosh, that's terrifying. Yeah, all right. That's when it's no longer a town. <laughs> Anywho. I have to agree, two people's not a town, question mark? It's a treehouse. <laughs> it's a treehouse. Yeah, two so. people is a couple, right? <laughs> That's what they all say. I'm going 
too much. Anyway, anyway, so with realistic fiction, God. you got to make sure that if you're doing realistic fiction or if you're doing semi-realistic fiction where it's fantasy, for example, a great one of this that is one of my favorites is Gravity Falls. It's fantasy, but it has the realistic fiction element of it's originally in a town where he's going to live with his um, great, uncle. great uncle, Grunkle. <laughs> he's great. And so it's very realistic at first, right? They're just trying to make friends. They're just trying to um, survive the summer and not die, and not die <laughs> of normal things. And then it slowly becomes less normal, right? But they did a really great job of making sure everyone in that town had an identity. And ultimately you learned a little bit about everyone because it's such a small town. You'd inevitably learn a little bit about everyone over the span of a summer. You have the time to get to know all 25 people, you know, <laughs> even if you just spent one day saying, hi, how are you every day for the summer, you'd learn everyone's name in the first month. So <laughs> with that, you guys just got to make sure if you're doing realistic fiction, that you know the necessary details and that if you're doing like a high school for instance you make sure it functions like a high school you make sure that it's not like i mean unless that's your whole purpose where you're like this particular high school worships demons and you're like oh my <laughs> you gotta explain why that's the case <laughs> if you're gonna have something unusual in your realistic fiction novel make make sure it makes sense for example um i pro well you probably haven't read this uh it's called The Lottery um, but by Shirley Jackson, I believe. But the whole concept, <laughs> it's messed up. The whole concept is basically, spoiler alert, um, everyone draws a ticket and the person with the black dot gets stoned to death. Ooh. <laughs> and that's that a, is that's their, a good that, way to go. <laughs> that is their tradition. And they believe if they don't do this tradition, then bad things will happen. They actually start having conversations at the beginning of the short story saying, oh my gosh, this town next door stopped doing it and their whole cornfield died. That's what you get for not doing it. <laughs> and it's like, whoa, okay, this is a messed up town. So if you're gonna do things like worshiping demons or a random lottery where someone kills someone, you gotta make sure it has a logic base, even if it's a flawed logic base, like in the lottery, that is a very flawed logic base. Red it's Vegas still, it still has a logic base. Yes. Well, to be fair. To be fair, it was very messed up for many other reasons. Yeah, it was but messed up. <laughs> but like, if you read the short story, it's only like what, five pages, maybe single spit, single. Spit? I read it. I read yeah. it in freshman year. Yeah, yeah. Most people read it once you get to high school, so that's why I mentioned it because I was like, you may or may not read it. Well, so you had to high school, so. <laughs> all right, so let's see. Forgot what I was about to say, so. Uh, you know, you're all good, you're all good. Uh, it happens to me too. Um, yeah, I just recently reread it for college and I was like, oh joy, this is fun. All right, so the last detail that I am going to mention today and then we're gonna talk about questions and comments or concerns is that make sure if the detail is important, you add it to your story. Ah. I promise I can spell detail. I'm slow today. Oh, I mean, weren't you like on a camera in front of people and your mind is focused on things other than spelling? Uh, I your brain. No, I completely agree. My brain just dies. All right. <laughs> so, like, I when I'm in front of people, I cannot English. You got to make sure the details that you do add are important. For example. Um, if you are going to name every single person in that town, like in Gravity Falls, you gotta make sure they all have a purpose. And they do, ultimately. Spoiler alert, they all have a purpose. Um, <laughs> they all have a purpose in the final battle and everything that happens in that town, right? But if it doesn't really matter, why do you need to name that Bob and Sally and Joe have a four-year-old named Tim, unless Tim's gonna get kidnapped? If, the, if Tim's gonna get kidnapped, then it's important to know Tim's name. They're just like, um, <laughs> but just if like, you Tim doesn't really matter, and Tim just runs around the town being a goofball because he's four, yeah, I don't think you really need to know. You can just say that four-year-old kid ran by me again. You don't need to give a name. <laughs> or it's just like, oh, uh, you can just add a detail. Everyone's name is Josh. Everyone's name is Josh. Oh lord, scary. Uh, like final book. It's like that. Or also, everyone's name is Josh. 
It's like, pardon? Yeah, you gotta make sure if it's an important detail that you add it, especially because this will help with your world building. So you put a However, you gotta make sure that if the detail is not important, you're willing to get rid of it. So like I mentioned earlier, with having certain, like this character believes in this religion. Well, if that religion is gonna change their whole concept of reality and how they follow things, or they're worshiping demons, like I said earlier, that's gonna cause a big problem. <laughs> Whereas if their um, if if their choice of worship is just like I absolutely think trees are sacred spirits and they matter to me, but and then, then they burn down. but then they burn down a tree later. You're like, okay, so clearly they don't matter that much. Just like, <laughs> so, like, just like I, there, you can convert it to something else. <laughs> something broke. Like, so either you convert it, you're a lunatic. Or they don't matter that much. Or they don't matter that much. You gotta make sure that if you mention things that they matter, that it's important to the story and that it's relevant. Um, this is another issue that people have with realistic fiction where they will name every single like jock on the football team or cheerleader in the squad or whatever. And it's like, do you really need to name every single person? What about just the two cheerleaders that are bullying her or the two cheerleaders that are her best friends? Either one. Point is, like, they are important. Like the other seventeen. Part, you're trying to get into the loop, so you like memorize everyone. Yes, names. yes. Now that would be important. That's okay. Yeah, if you're trying, if you have this girl who's like, I desperately want to be a cheerleader, so I'm gonna memorize all their names. Kelly, Sally, Ali, you know, there she's like muttering them to herself and knows all their names. That is absolutely important. But you gotta have a reason for it. It's gotta have, like I said, it's gotta have importance. It's gotta make sure that the details are showing rather than telling. You want to make sure that once again portion sizes. You're not dumping X amount of detail on them and they only needed Y to solve the mystery. I mean, you can throw in a couple of red herrings, but red herrings are good. A sea of red herring is bad. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 don't, we don't like cute little red birds, not the red sea. Yes, exactly. We want tiny, not the red sea. All right, um, we have about 10 minutes left. Do you guys have any questions about this lesson or other writing concepts that we can talk about in the last 10 minutes of the video? Well, well, how do you feel about everyone dying at the end of the story? Ooh, how do I feel about everyone dying at the end of the story? Coco Except Coco. for the villain. Except for the villain. Um, I think it's perfectly acceptable just so long as you foreshadow it in the beginning. And you make sure that as you go along, not only are you A, connected to everyone, but B, you see it coming. Because if your readers don't see it coming, they will feel like it is deus ex machina. And that you're just pissing them off. <laughs> but if you're doing it kind of like, um, Rogue One, was that yes, it? Yes, yes. Yeah, if you're yeah. doing it, spoiler, That's spoiler, like the they all die in the end. <laughs> it's like the only movie that everyone knows where everyone dies yeah, in the end. Get over it! But anyway, so with Rogue One, that one, they foreshadowed it, A. And B, you know that a lot of um, the times when they do Star Wars, they have little details, right? That don't seem to matter, but then they flesh out later. And one of those is when Leia says, many people died to get this information to us about the Death Star, right? You, they never elaborated on that before, but now you're like, oh shoot, many people died? How many? Most. <laughs> you're like, I'm watching their story and now I'm wondering if any of them live. You, you know, it's possible that all of them die. But you also want to make sure that you have a connection to them. Because if they make them care about your characters, if you you're make, yeah, kill them off. Make them care about your characters if you're going to kill them off. Because if you just kill them off randomly and they become the red shirt guy in Star Trek that always dies, that's a problem. Yes. So basically, do and don't do a George R. R. Martin. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> do and don't. <laughs> so I would, I would say, yeah, there, there are pros and cons to both, and I think that it is perfectly valid to have characters die at the end, and to have a lot of characters die even, especially if it's a war thing that you're doing, like it's a fantasy war. Like, kind of like in, uh, spoiler alert, Harry Potter, um, <laughs> it's the seventh book where it's a fantasy war, right? A lot of good characters die in that. A lot. That makes perfect sense. 
But if you're just having people drop dead left and right for no apparent reason that you don't really care about, I mean, that's okay to a certain extent. Hence why we mentioned red shirt guys in Star Trek. They need to have it be semi-realistic. They can't have everyone on the ship survive. They need to have certain people die who have no emotional relevance. But you can't do that too often. You can't just say, oh, this whole ship, it's the, it's the goal, the reason we came into space to save them. And then when they die, you're just not even sad. You gotta make sure it's sad. If you're gonna kill off yeah. everyone and have the villain survive, you gotta make sure that your reader is bawling by the end. That is all I will say, Sterling. Yes. So, <laughs> wait. Yes. Red shirt. Sulu? <laughs> no, not, no, Sulu's gonna be a but, but, no, it's, it's an old term, technically, I think now, because in the original right. TV show that they had, but that was like, was it the doc? Was, was it the doctor? <laughs> Um, not technically, it's just literally it's everyone who's a red that. shirt, for some reason they would die in the original oh, yeah, TV yeah. show. Yeah. And you like wouldn't even know who they were. Officers. They would just, yeah, there was the security officers and they'd be like, we're gonna go fight the alien. And they all started dying. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's just, it's more of a, it's a, it's a dated term, I'll be honest. Maybe I should say clones. The Clone Wars, or like Kenny from South Park, <laughs> <laughs> or different things like that. Yeah, so dies and then comes back the next episode. <laughs> so it, they, their dying has no relevance or meaning, really. They just die <laughs> for the sake of it. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so that is my opinion on everyone dying at the end, Sterling. Yes. Second How question. do you do like air quotes like these in the story? Like Ooh. mother. That is a great question. I italicize. I I would say either italicize or just genuinely add in quotes and make sure that it's obvious in the sentence that someone's not talking. Like for example, if you say, my mother continued to brush her hair. She's obviously not saying mother out loud. Um, so I would say italicize and possibly do like, regular quotes. Your choice. Rapunzel hadn't spotted a flaw in mother's disguise in a while. Yeah, I would say absolutely, that works. It yeah, so with, it makes it so it's, it's obvious it's not dialogue. Yeah, with that one, make it obvious it's not dialogue. I've seen like, use that's true. Apostrophes works. instead as quotations. That also works. Um, that's the one, that's the one problem with editing. And part of the reason you want to make sure that generally, before your editor, you make sure you get a sample first. Again, I'll talk more about this in Adult Writers Club slash the Advanced Lessons. But make sure you get a sample first because you don't know if their style is going to clash with yours. And sometimes it does because. Every editor is slightly different. Yes, there are certain things that are X, Y, and Z. You know, you do this, I do this. You can't have she in the middle of a sentence about a dude unless there's some reason for it. You know, it's probably a typo. You know, it's got to just, yeah. it's got to make sense and be cohesive. And there are certain grammar rules and comma rules. But there are also certain things that are just stylistic. All right. Any other questions? We have about four minutes before the end of this particular one. So, world building questions. Okay, we can do another question about something else if you'd like. <laughs> Anywho. So, any other questions about world building? Plot structure. Oh, my favorite plot structure. I like the seven point. It's a seven point. That is mine, too. Seven points is absolutely where I go. I, if you want, I can do a whole video on it. Although, Dan Wells already has a video on it, so I feel, like, inferior. Um, <laughs> and Dan Wells does a fabulous one on the seven points. Um, but, yeah, seven points is absolutely... It's my favorite. I love it. It makes it perfectly encompassed. You can put almost any other plot structure within that plot structure because it's just so universal, and it functions. Beautifully. So I agree. Seven points is superior, but that's just my opinion. <laughs> other people might say save the cat. Um, other people might say snowflake. Other people have the dragon method. Um, there's like okay, hang on. so Holding many up, different methods of plotting. So many. We have the seven plot point, the three plot point, which I don't recommend, but uh, well. Yeah. We have the save the cat. Um, the three plot point only really works if you're a panzer. Yeah. <laughs> Slash gardener. I don't know which term people use anymore. Um, <laughs> I say it is. We mentioned character-driven plotting. We did yes. Hero's Journey. We did Snowflake. 
That is really good notes. I appreciate it. <laughs> and I think that's all the ones we mentioned. Yeah. So, there. like I said, there's a bunch. There's a bunch of different plotting methods, and they all have validity and reason. And it's okay if one works better for you and another doesn't. But I would say seven points generally works for everyone. Again, unless you're a pantser slash gardener, in which case seven point can work for some pantsers and gardeners, but for some people that's even too much. Like I know with one of my friends, Jade, she's absolutely amazing. However. If you put her even in a seven point plot structure, her brain malfunctions and can't write the book. <laughs> but if you do three point plot structure where she's like, okay, here's the beginning, here's the middle, here's the end, she can do that flawlessly. So it, it depends on who you are and what you're doing. But yes, seven point is absolutely my favorite and I will carry its flag to my grave. <laughs> Unless someone comes up with a better one, but I doubt that, it's very nice. All right, any other questions about world building? It can be anything, including, did you like the ending of this thing, as long as I know it? <laughs> Words of reasons. Oh, I never read it, sorry. <laughs> I know, I'm a horrible person, I haven't read Words of Radiance. So. Yeah, part of the problem is that ever since I got into college, it's pretty much been textbooks and whatever they tell me to read. Um, so, <laughs> it's, it's a lot. That's fair. But, but yes, um, any other questions about world building? Was there anything you disagreed with or agreed with today that you'd like to delve into more? In the meantime, I'm just going to write down all the world building stuff. In that case then, I might as well just end the video here. So, sounds great. We did uh, covered a lot with world building today. If there are any questions that you have for people watching the video at home, make sure to leave, um, I would say leave a comment, but I don't know when I'm going to get to the comments. So instead send me an email because I will put my email down in the link below. Thank you.